Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Maria Howell, and I am Director of Alumni and Family Engagement and a proud member of the Class of 1991. I am thrilled to welcome you all to our virtual book club discussion with Heath Hardage Lee, author of the prize-winning book, Winnie Davis, Daughter of the Lost Cause, and the narrative nonfiction book that we're talking about tonight, The League of Wives, the untold story of the women who took on the US government to bring their husbands home from Vietnam. Heath comes from a museum education, preservation and program background. She holds a BA in history with honors from our own Davidson College in the class of 1992 and an MA in French language and literature from the University of Virginia. Heath is an independent historian, biographer and curator. In 2017, Heath served as the Robert J. Dole Curatorial Fellow and her exhibition similarly entitled The League of Wives, Vietnam POW MIA Advocates and Allies about Vietnam POW MIA Wives premiered at the Dole Institute of Politics in May of 2017. The exhibit is still traveling through 2023 to museum venues all over the United States. I hope you all will take the chance to go and see it if it comes um, near you. Heath writes about women's history and politics for publications such as Time, The Hill, and The Atlantic. Actress Reese, Reese Witherspoon and her production company, Hello Sunshine, in partnership with Sony 3000, have optioned The League of Wives for a feature film, Heath is an executive producer and historical consultant for the project. Her next book, a new biography of First Lady Pat Nixon is coming from St. Martin's Press in 2024. Make sure you mark your calendar for that. Heath also has a television series about Pat Nixon in development. For those of you joining us, Heath and I will have a conversation. Then I'll ask the questions that were submitted online in advance. Thank you for those who did that before we open it up to questions from the audience here tonight. If you have any questions for Heath throughout the event, please place them in the Zoom chat as you think of them, and I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um, if you think about it, add your name and connection to Davidson or class year if relevant, if you don't mind my using that when I ask the question. You may also send your question directly to my colleague, Hannah Jacob, if you do not wish to submit it in the public chat. We have enabled live auto transcription for this event. If you'd like to enable this on your end, just click the live transcription CC icon and select show subtitle. Please note that captions are automated so they may not be as accurate as we would like. And a final reminder that we may discuss some book spoilers. So if you haven't finished reading the book, The League of Wives, this is your warning. Heath, thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to give shout outs to all my 92 friends. I love how many people are here. I saw the list, know who you are. So I'm um, excited uh, to have them here and um, wanted to also give some shout outs to some of the POW wives I interviewed for my book that are here. Um, Patsy Creighton is here, Janie Schutte. I think Marty Halliburton and possibly Andrea Rander, along with Porter Halliburton, a POW who is also a wildcat who is here, I believe, tonight. So I want to say hello to everybody and hello to Sally McMillan, my favorite history professor from Davidson, one of my favorite professors of all time ever. I know she is here and maybe Barbara Ballard who was a visiting professor who had such a, a huge impression on me when I was at Davidson. She may be here as well. So thank you all for coming. And uh, class of 92, I know we have a June reunion. What is it? Hashtag we show up. So I guess we show up. So anyway, glad great. everyone's here. <laughs> thank you so much. It's a great introduction. Um, for those listening tonight who've not yet had a chance to pick up the book, the League of Wives. Heath has shared a short promo video. It's just three minutes. It sets up the premise of the book nicely. Even if you've already read the book, the archival footage and photos that are used in this video will help to bring the text alive. So we're going to watch that. We'll come back and we'll ask some questions.
The Vietnam War affected people in many different ways. Vietnam, you typically think of the men fighting the North Vietnamese communists. What you don't think of are the women on the home front whose husbands have been shot down. So they are left at home to cope with the wreckage of that situation. The wives of American prisoners and missing during Vietnam are some of the unknown heroines of the war. Once aviators start falling out of the sky um, in larger numbers, the government under Lyndon B. Johnson says, keep quiet. Wives, sit down, shut up, keep quiet. Do not say a word to anyone. The wives can't take it anymore. Sybil Stockdale organizes the women into a national league Sybil was highly educated, she had drive and ambition, and she had grit. She was even a match for Richard Nixon. Sybil and her League of Wives are forced to go to Washington to constantly remind the government about their husbands languishing in prison and the fact that the government is letting them die. Without the support of Sybil and her League of Wives, many more men would have been tortured and they would have died in prison. These women come from all across the country, from different backgrounds, different races. Jane Denton is a Southern belle who finds out she has a spine of steel when her husband is shot down. Andrea Rander was a Baltimore Army wife who ran a crisis hotline at a mental health clinic. Phyllis Galani left her shyness behind when she confronted the North Vietnamese in Sweden. As young military brides, these women thought they would have a charmed life. Instead, they had to dig deep for resources, strength, and courage that they didn't even know that they had. One of the feistiest women on the East Coast was Louise Mulligan. When you're, when you're fighting for something that is so precious, you're willing to do almost anything. Thank you so much for sharing that powerful video. Um, now that we have, now that everyone has some context for your book, let's get started with some of the questions that our guests submitted ahead of time. Current parent Julie Merva asks, um, "How did you become interested in writing about these courageous women?" Yes, well, kind of a, a little bit of a long story. I'll try to condense. So. My first book, uh, I had spent a lot of time at Virginia Historical Society in Richmond working on this and the staff knew I was looking, I always, you know, have been in this hidden stories about women forever, long before it was cool, when nobody really cared about it. So, you know, I'm always kind of looking for these, these treasures. So I had, you know, my first book, I had found a really interesting woman of the Reconstruction era, Civil War era. And then I was giving a talk at Virginia Historical Society about that book, kind of fishing for another topic. And the staff said, after the talk, they said, Heath, we have got some papers that you really need to see. And these papers happen to be the papers of Phyllis Eason Galanti, who is the beautiful blonde lady on the cover of my book, who just happened to be a dear friend of my mother's. They were in a book club together for 30 years, and Phyllis had just passed away from a very unexpectedly. She had leukemia, but it was a, a form they thought was very treatable, and no one had expected her to pass away so so quickly. And, and sadly, she had died. I, I knew about it and I was like, why didn't I ever talk to her? I knew she was an activist during Vietnam. That was it. And, and I had known her my whole life just socially, but you know, I had made the mistake of never really asking her too much about it. But then the staff tells me about the papers. I go in and spend a couple of hours with her papers and knew immediately that this was like an epic, war story. And it, it didn't have all the pieces, but it had the skeleton of this great narrative because Phyllis's husband, Paul Galanti, 
was a POW who had been shot down and was in the infamous Hanoi Hilton. And Phyllis was one of this, became one of this league of wives who agitated and became a, a national figure in her efforts to get her husband out of the Hanoi Hilton. So Phyllis led me to the West Coast, to Sybil Stockdale and many others in the book and all over the country. But Phyllis was the starting point. And, and that was how I got into it and decided, I mean, it, it just kind of fell in my lap. I, it was not like a real difficult decision. It was made in about two hours after I saw Phyllis's papers. So I bet you wish you'd been able to interview her as well. Um. <laughs> One of the great regrets um, that I was not able to do that, though I had met her many times as my mother's friend, but just, you know, was so mired in the Civil War for so long that I just couldn't, I kept getting pulled into that other book. And, you know, you kind of have to have tunnel vision sometimes to finish these books. So I had wrapped up that war and decided, I think I need another war. Let's just bring another one on that I know is absolutely zero about. That was not a war. Um, Sally McMillan had prepared me very well to know about particularly post-Civil War politics and the Reconstruction era. But Vietnam was one, you know, they really weren't teaching so much. I know Dr. Shai had a course, I believe, on Vietnam, but I, I A, didn't really know I was interested at that time, and B, it wasn't a popular war, obviously, and I think that it's taken a long time for people to get around to really teaching it and feeling comfortable talking about it. Um, it's definitely one of those wars people really don't don't like to dissect as much. Yes, I I, I know that. <laughs> um, and you also have done um, when you look at history, you oftentimes are looking through the lens of women. Yes. Um, and so also your Civil War book is really about the women of the Civil War. Absolutely. I always <laughs> want something different. You know, we know most of the stories of men, both in the Civil War and the Vietnam War, not all, but many are so well done. They're excellent. They're well publicized. But the women, you know, are still very secondary figures. So I try to always put the lens on them first. And then the men second, the men are the supporting players and the women get, you know, stage the front of the stage. Well, it's apropos that we're talking about that during Women's History Month. Oh, great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, Mary Nix Hollowell, class of 86, asked, how did you devise your good title? Oh, the title. Well, that was also really easy. Um, so there is, if, if you read the book, the League of Wives is the first iteration of the national group, which has this really long, complicated name, the National League of Families for American Servicemen in Southeast Asia, um, or American Prisoners and Missing in Southeast Asia, which is such a mouthful. And I, I still have to write it all out to remember all the pieces of it. But the League of Wives, this, it was actually called the San Diego League of Wives. This is where this POW MIA movement starts in Coronado, California. And it starts under Sybil Stockdale and really starts being called the San Diego League of Wives and then abbreviated to the League of Wives and then even down to the League. So that I liked that it was simple. And then it also made me think of this movie that's not very good, but it, it's a known movie, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And I wanted to just flip that on its head and have The League of Extraordinary Women, which, you know, was a title I had thought about. But League of Wives was just perfect. You know, it had the superhero connotation and it had the group because the, the power of the group is such a theme of this book that League, uh, League of Nations, you know, it just calls to mind a lot of good imagery and, and uh, different groups that we know about that I thought people would respond to. So it, it was very easy. Titles are usually very easy for me. They tend to come without a lot of effort. It's just writing the book that's the hard part. <laughs> That's a, that is a perfect segue into the next question, which is Mary Edwards from Class of 86 asked, what is your writing process? Oh, God. Well, it's not very organized, formal, or anything else. I have, uh, until this year, had two teenagers at home and a, a rotten French bulldog. So, you know, they're just running the show most of the time. And I, it, it isn't, I, I mean, I try to you know, I, I shoot for like a, summer, a certain number of hours every day, but it doesn't always 
get done. And the hours might not all be writing. They might be, I, I'm very interview based. I do tons of oral histories and interviews. I really have more of a journalism curatorial background. So that's what I really love to do. And I could interview until hell freezes over, you know, because that's so much fun. And then I immerse, you know, I try to immerse in it. So it might at first be reading and interviews and taking the oral histories. And now I'm into the, the hard part, which is writing, just sitting your butt in the chair and writing for, you know, I try to do like three hours a day. It's not that much, but over time, it, it adds up. And I also need some time to like marinate it, it with it for a day or so. And then I'll go back and, and edit it again. But it is definitely not formal or super organized. It is not like Hemingway and Fitzgerald where they get to have their wives like, you know, babysitting all their kids so they can go do it. I'm usually doing the dishes and doing the laundry and trying to write in between and chauffeuring people or taking them to college visits, you know how how that can be. Um, but when I get really into it at the end, then I really do have to shut everybody out the last six months and just pound it out. Um, so it increases as you get closer to the deadline. And I think I remember you were telling me that it took you about five years to complete this book. Yeah. Both of the books. I mean, I am slow and my editor's like, good Lord, could you just, you know, step it up a little bit? And I'm like, no, because they have to bake that long. And I, I never start writing. I always give myself two years to immerse. I'm fortunate. I, you know, I'm able to do that, but two years. So I know it cold before I even consider starting to write. I think the problem with so many books now, even the a particularly popular history is people do not know the topic and they start writing. And I think your conclusions are then not as strong as they could be if you immersed in it almost like a language, like, you know, going to France and immersing in that language is like, that's how you learn it. And I think that's the same with a, a narrow topic, you know, and even with that, that like Vietnam, I, th there's so much about that war. I don't know. It's just my little corner of that. I want to be fluent in it before I even start writing. Um, but yeah, four to five years. I think the last book took four years. The first book took five. This last book took four years. And this one on Pat Nixon, it'll be four years before it's out. Yeah. And that's even a narrower topic. So. <laughs> it is. It should be shorter. You know what? My editor but you pointed that out. Believe me. He was like, what about three years? I was like, no, because that... No, there's a whole Watergate trust issue that has to be overcome to even get in the door with that. So we can talk about that later. But um, yeah, I will need every bit of four years to get that done. Well, that's wonderful. So once you've finished writing and considering and, you know, immersing yourself into the book and all the topics, um, Chris Malino, class of 2020, asked, how do you then navigate the editing and publishing phase? Oh boy. Well, I love it when I'm just editing because like, to me, it's kind of like you just have so much material and the way that I work, it, it is not pretty. I'm so glad no one can see my desk and, and table. It's like, it's frightening. So I just kind of vomit everything up and then you start, I should use a prettier metaphor. It's more like marble sculpture, you know, like a big chunk of marble and you're sculpting it, sculpting it, sculpting it down to refine it. And, and so I like that refining process a lot. That's actually one of my favorite parts. The hard part is getting the words on the page and they don't have to be great, but they give you that chunk of marble to work with. And then you can sculpt it and go over it and refine it until it's really good. So the editing process I actually like, and that usually takes like for this Next book, I'll turn in the manuscript in 2023. We'll spend about nine months in editing. And then um, we'll get towards the end, we'll be working on wrapping up stuff like the audio book and all the related PR. And then, you know, I try to write articles around the book to give it a boost. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of work at the end. But at that point, you know the story, you know what your thesis is, and you're just cutting it down. You're just making packaging it. Um, and I love marketing. I love giving talks. I actually am a weird author in that I love the sales and marketing part. I mean, more than actually writing it, which is really, really hard. 
So I prefer the end and um, publishing. I, you know, I've been with St. Martin's. Uh, my first book was with University of Nebraska Press. Um, it was more of an academic book. And then the last book was uh, commercial press with St. Martin's. And this will also be with St. Martin's with the same editor that I adore. And we just work really well together. It's been very smooth. So um, knock on wood, it will be the same process for the next book. And that's nice to have, I would think, the same publisher that yes. you already know is it in the same editor because um, you have your process down. So um, much easier the second time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I hope to keep this editor as long as he will keep me. So um, yes, it's it's been a good fit. Great. Um, Nell McCorkle Bordeaux, class of 87, brings us a little bit closer to home and by home, I mean Davidson, and asks, how did Davidson prepare you for the life you now live as a historian, curator, and writer? Oh, gosh. Well, I can't say enough great things about Davidson with that. And I also have to give a shout out to St. Catharines, my high school in Richmond, who, which we did call the convent and, you know, lots of things that were not very nice sometimes. But between the two schools, I felt like, writing, public speaking, editing, oh boy, and those end notes, which I hate so much, but I mean, I do know how to do this. Like, you know, I was so prepared between the two schools for the writing, the speaking, the curatorial. I mean, we we were so far ahead of most people in, in that area. And, you know, when I came out, it was a little bit out of fashion. You know, as a history major with a basically a French minor and went on to get a master's in French. And, you know, everyone's like, oh my God, those degrees, like what in the world are you going to do? And now I feel like there's a real renaissance with particularly writing and speaking and creating content. Like we are being valued now. And I thought I would be like long dead before anyone cared about that. When, not, when I came out of school, particularly, it was just so hard to find the jobs. Um, and I was so lucky to, to find a job in Charlotte at the Levine Museum of the New South. If you're not familiar with it, it's a wonderful um, civil rights museum. And I, I cannot, I, they trained me how to do oral histories also, which I had learned a little bit about before, of course, at Davidson. So I, I think I had about the best preparation you could have to write books, to curate exhibits, to, to talk about this. Um, and, and not have to have the PhD. You know, that's, I know that was a question that someone else was asking about. And, you know, I wish if I could do it over again, I might do it a little differently. And my master's, by the way, is not, is not in um, American history. It's really in French history and culture. So, um, but I think it all helped. You know, I'd learned how to, how to deal with things from a research perspective very well with, with that master's degree. And um, I think if you want to teach, obviously, if you want to be somewhere like Davidson, you will need a PhD. But if you're going into something like public history or uh, the work I do is very journalistic. And for me, it was more about writing, just the opportunity to write in different formats that I think helps so much. So I don't think you have to have the PhD to do what I'm doing um, at all. But you do need a lot of writing experience, whether it be newspapers, magazines. I did a lot of writing for a lot of different formats. And I had a grant writing business for years, which, oh, my God, that will I, I am. I never even tell people I do that because they always want you to do it. But that was wonderful training too, learning how to take things that aren't compelling and make them compelling, which is kind of what grants are sometimes all about. So um, anyway, a long answer to your question. Well, thank you. Um, you mentioned the MLA notes, and I noted that in your book um, that you had 32 pages of end notes. Um, and, I, and I looked at that and I said, oh, she went to Davidson. Um, do you have, and your Davidson faculty members would be very proud. Well, thank um, you. Do you have an MLA style guide or a, um, or a grammar uh, pet peeve lesson that you wish everybody knew that you'd like to share with this group tonight that, so that they can go away knowing that? <laughs> well, no, but I do have a secret suggestion of how to make them more fun 
which is have a glass of wine while you're doing the end notes, which is what I did because that was literally the only way I could get through them. And it's okay. I had a copy editor and I had another person helping me double check them. So the alcohol did not distort any of them, but it did make things go. I mean, it made me much happier while I was doing it. It was very measured, moderate amount, but it helped. I mean, that is the only way to get through that. On, on the flip side, on the more serious side, I, I will tell you a pet peeve that I have with, with fun, wonderful books that I've read. I will not name any names, but books like mine that are great, but they have no end notes. They have no documentation. There's one notable example. I loved this book and I go to the end of the book. Oh my gosh, where, where did she get all this information? Not a word, no end note, no bibliography, no sources. That to me makes it not count. It kind of negates it. I mean, it is so important to document and particularly with women's history. I, I, it is, there are too many footnotes in this book, but I felt like I had to put all of them because there is so little of this history was written. I mean, literally some of it was no lie on cocktail napkins or on, I mean, like in folders, like on little strips of paper or just, you know, it was, it was really ephemeral and I felt like it needed the grounding of a, a really good in notes that were serious and hefty because if, if we don't write it down, it's just going to be, be lost. So that's the more serious side, but, um, a good Sauvignon Blanc definitely helps on in notes. That's what I would recommend. Glad to hear that. I also, um, I also feel like I could go back and do some of the research and it would be really fascinating if someone gets taken away with the book and really fascinated with, I could go back and look up and say, oh, I want to read this and how can I find this? And, um, and that just helps continue learning and the love of learning for all of the rest of us who might get enraptured in this um, in your topic. So, anyway. I agree. <laughs> it's like a whole other book you can dive into many other books that way. And I do that. I love to read people's end notes. That's where you really get some of those extra stories. So mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's really, really important to do a good job on those. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. Were there any particular experiences at Davidson or any specific Davidson faculty members who influenced your decision to become a historian? biographer slash curator. <laughs> yes. Well, of course, Sally McMillan, who I just adore. And I know you're here, Sally. So really, Sally was the reason I went into this. And I did dedicate my first book to Sally because I she was such a huge influence. I mean, th there are people who I they may not ever know what a big influence they are. And I've been lucky to have the opportunity to talk to Sally about this before, but um, she just, I just thought she was like the coolest person ever, which she is when she came in to, to teach us. And when I was there, you know, 92, I mean, women's history had been around of course for a long time, but it was just beginning to get its due. And I like had never even though I went to an all girls school, had never really been taught that way. And it was just a huge eye opener to take a lens and look at it just through that lens, just the women looking at it that way, thinking about it that way. It just kind of blew my mind. So that was, you know, that was why I did, I did my thesis um, on the very woman who became that first book. Um, I did. And now, unfortunately, Sally could not be my advisor that year, which I did shed some tears about that. And also over the advisor I got who I won't name, but it all worked out. You know, it was totally fine and um, good to have an advisor who maybe didn't share that same love that I had. It made me work harder. It made me maybe more critical of some of my theses at the beginning. So it all, you know, added to a really good product at the end. So um, Dr. McMillan, number one, and then also Barbara Ballard, who was um, a visiting professor, you know, that we've, I've talked about a bit um, with the staff beforehand. Uh, she visited, I believe it was, it was my senior year. So it was like 91 to 92. And she um, did African-American studies and something again, that has been around for a long time, but was just not getting the focus. And that also was just, I was blown away by all these things I had no, never heard of, didn't know. And it, it was a lot about putting the angle on a narrower topic within the framework of a huge topic, say 
the Civil War, the Vietnam War. So those two women were pivotal. I mean, huge impact. I mean, I would not have done this job, this career. I don't think I would have gone into it without them. So um, both of them, I want to give huge thanks for that. And of course, then I had a million other wonderful teachers in the French department. Dr. Jacobus, I loved in his surrealist poems. I mean, we just had so much fun. Like just, I loved the French department, Dr. Yoder. I mean, all these wonderful teachers. And, and that added to just the background, the appreciation of language and culture. So, um, you know, I, I really had a great experience with everyone. Um, even the people who I was, their classes I was terrible at, like baby bio, I think it was Dr. Kimmel. I mean, I'm so bad at science and math. God bless him for even passing me, you know, like that and Kitty Kim, like I would, I love those, those guys were awesome. They just got me through it so I could get to what was my uh, wheelhouse. So nothing but great things to say about Davidson professors. Glad to hear that. And um, you're a bunch of other people are joining in, um, in affirmations of Dr. McMillan and Dr. Ballard as well <laughs> um, through, the, through the chat, um, watching that come up. Um, your classmate, Hillary Coleman, asked, um, what is your biggest challenge in voicing these characters and their history? Uh, that was a really interesting question. What a good question, Hillary. Hillary and I went to Williamsburg this summer together and had so much fun because we're both history nerds, totally, you know, going to the museums and all that. Um, you know, I think what's hard is you don't want, I am not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So it is hard to not theorize too much about why someone was the way that they were. And I mean, as a historian, they do, they pay you the big bucks. And I say that you know, facetiously, but they, they do pay you to interpret. So you have to interpret to the best of your knowledge, but not start playing psychiatrist. And there's a fine line there. So, you know, I try to, to base it on documents and interviews. It has to be based on something real, a real fact or a real observation that somebody made, not um, amateur psychology but you do have to stretch yourself a little bit in your analysis. So, you know, that is difficult. And then I think also it, it takes a long time to build trust with certain subjects, particularly if you have a sensitive topic. I mean, I've seen this both with the League of Wives. Um, there's a lot of PTSD there, you know, going on with both uh, the POWs and, and the wives and the children. And so, you know, you, you need to take the time to, to gain people's trust and to spend time with them and to really do your best to understand where they're coming from and not be judgmental, like leave the judgment out, you know, leave your own politics out, leave your judgment out, leave, you know, your life experience doesn't necessarily apply. Um, so that that's, those are all hard things, but I think if you take the time to do it right, um, it makes a big difference in the end product. I would guess so. And also, um, Cecily Craighill from Class of 91 asked, and I think you mentioned this a little bit in what you were saying before, that the challenges and opportunities that you write about when you're writing about recent history um, and the tales of people who are still living, um, I would assume that that would be a, an interesting challenge as you speak with them, as you try to write and honor um, those stories. Oh, yes. Well, you know, biographers have a saying better off dead, which does make me laugh. So <laughs> I have to say I've done dead people I've dealt with and I've dealt with living people. Now, dead people are great because they don't argue with whatever you come up with. So that is a big plus. However, I would always choose having living subjects over working with dead subjects because obviously dead subjects are really not working with them. It's all, you know, oral histories or archival stuff or whatever. And that's great. But for me to be able to pick up the phone and ask someone, which I do now all the time with this last book and was able to do with these wonderful wives that helped me with this other book for, for Pat Nixon, for the new book, I have a lot of the East Wing staff that worked for Mrs. Nixon they were all women in their 20s. And so they're all very much alive and well and, and willing to talk. And they are a huge source. And I can call them up and say, 
you know, what did the hemlines look like at this point? Or what happened when, you know, LBJ gave this speech and then Nixon responded, like from the serious to the not so serious, I have someone on call, basically, or numerous people. And I much prefer that. And also to say, what do you think about this thesis about this? Is this right? Am I on the right track? And I have, you know, recently had someone say, yes, that is exactly right. And I have had someone say, that is completely wrong. You need to go back. You need to look at this. So give me the live people. I mean, there are issues with people who are live, but I will take them over not being able to, to ask whenever I want. It's, yeah. it's a very different experience. And to check your thesis, as you and said. I think that's, that's so nice and, and useful. And I wish we would write more about history that's current to do that so that we don't come up with all these books that some of them have theses that I don't agree with. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. this is, you can fact check. I mean, I do it all the time. Am I heading in, in the right direction? I don't ask them what to tell me, but I'm like, am I heading in the right direction or I'm re am I really off base? And I've been both. So um, yeah, That's love good. to pick up the phone and just ask. That's great. Um, Joseph Jones from the class of 1970 asked, how does the activism of POW wives locate within the broader spectrum of Vietnam War resistance? That's a big oh, question. <laughs> that is, no, that's a great question because, you know, there is this spectrum, and I like that word for this. Um, there's a spectrum of both women and activists on the left and those on the right and those in the middle. And the League of Wives, that, which became the National League of Families, was a nonpartisan, not, uh, not a political group, completely nonpartisan. So, you know, there, there weren't, I mean, there always politics, but there weren't, they did not set out to have a, a political view. So they were on, I, I would say many of them, though, at the first, at the outset, tended to be more conservative, tended to be, you know, military wives, very by the book very conservative and many by the end had gone completely the other way had just had had it after eight years of this but i wouldn't say they they even went over to the left they became kind of disgusted with with all government so i could really relate to that point of view by the end of the of the story um but then you had on the left you had people like cora weiss who i write about in the book and jane fonda you know you had women who were very much on the left and, and part of the left, more of a leftist agenda. And they were also resisting the war. You know, they were more about, you know, no bombing, you know, peace. We need peace at any price, you know, that kind of thing. And then the wives I'm working with did tend to be resisting, but more uh, to the right, uh, more to the middle, to the right. So there was just a whole space spectrum of these activists doing doing different things by the end of the war everyone has really had it and I I just I felt the book I think sometimes there's some criticism that it's a lot of like inside baseball and all the different you know fights that the women waged but I wanted you to feel how hard they had to fight and how disgusted they were at times with the government that was doing this so they were activists and resisting in their own way, but it's all within a broader political spectrum. So I try to write about all these women in the book, some some not in as much depth, depth than um, others. Yeah. And I have to imagine that you were also frustrated with the U.S. government when you were writing this book. In hindsight, they could have so easily harnessed the power of the women earlier who just seem to want desperately to support their government and keep things under wraps. Totally. Oh my gosh. I was so angry. I mean, literally throwing things. It was like a I was having a tantrum for them. It made me so angry. And all the women who are on this call, Janie and Patsy, Andrea, Marty, I mean, they all, you, you ladies know, I mean, it was so frustrating and it made no sense that was the other thing it was nonsensical and it was like one hand did not know what the other hand was doing that was the problem like the military would do one thing the government would do something else everyone was very siloed and I talk about that a lot in the book that there was no collaborative communication between the departments 
But then, you know, you have some mavericks like Bob Burroughs, who we, we may talk about. He was such a great character in the book. And, and he's a maverick, but he's doing the right thing. He is the naval intelligence officer who helps um, many of these POW wives code secret letters to their husbands in the Hanoi Hilton. And he tries to help them find out what the hell is going on, you know? So, but he's blocked. Like these wives are at every turn by people in different departments who don't want him going out of his little circumscribed, you know, piece of the government. I mean, really, I don't think a lot has changed today, honestly, you know, this is how it works, but it's so frustrating when you take kind of an aerial view of it and you see how we would all be so much better off collaborating, sharing information, pooling our resources like the wives do in, in the book. Yes. Um, I really was fascinated when you talked about how Bob Burroughs got them to do the coding and how complicated it was. Can you explain a little more? I was, I was trying to figure out how that worked. How did that work? How did they code those secret letters? Well, I, I did make a very deliberate decision not to tell you exactly how it works because you know, a lot of this coding is still the basis of some coding that goes on today. And um, some in, in the POW and MIA community said, please consider not spelling it out in the book. Even though this is, a lot of this is declassified. If you, you know, go on different websites, you can find it. But I wanted to give you more of the impression, um, more just the broader strokes of how that works. But there have been a number of exhibits that go into it. And I, you know, I would just say broadly, you know, there's letters and numbers and different coding strategies you can use. There are things like double speak, you know, and I do talk about a lot of the letters that the wives wrote where they would basically give clues in the letter that only the recipient, the prisoner of war, would understand, like a reference or something really weird. Like one of the letters I talk about, Sybil, I know you'll you'll know she's writing to Jim like, oh, your mother is swimming in the ocean and all this stuff. And, and Jim would know, he knew his mother would never have taken a swim in the ocean. So, you know, that piques his interest and, um, you know, different ways, like she mentions Darkness at Noon, which was a famous book about, you know, communist propaganda. So there's like little Easter eggs kind of in here hidden for them that they will know that their communist um, and prisoners will, will have no clue about, or we hope that they won't. And things, um, you know, that encourage them to um, use methods to open up the letter, to, you know, see things with invisible ink, um, to put water or urine on something to make the invisible ink come up so you can read the message. So there are all kinds of little ways that, that I do talk about in the book without going into the mechanics of coding. And it's also because there's some other books about coding and women who do this or, and men too, that I, I honestly, I found it very boring. I found the mechanics really boring. And that's me in my liberal arts background. Like I am not into math or science or I can barely keep up with how it all works. It's very complicated. So I just was like, I don't, I don't really want to read about that. So there's enough information out there. I just gave you the broad strokes and tried to protect, you know, that process a little bit mainly to honor that community and, and what I'd heard from them. That makes a lot of sense. When you mentioned Sybil's letter, one of the things I noted was that I think she said that his mother was soaking in the ocean. And I was thinking that meant he needed to soak the letter. Yes. But I, maybe I maybe I made that leap. <laughs> no, you were 100% right. That's exactly. And I did not make that. Yeah, bring that home. That's right. It was, you know, all your mother needs is a good soak, soak. Hint, hint, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if this movie it continues to get made, I mean, one scene we'd all like to have is the fly on the wall scene where, where Jim Stockdale goes, oh my God, and soaks the letter using his own urine, I believe, because, you know, water was so hard to come by um, and sees this message from his wife. I mean, that just gives me chills to even think about it. So um, yes, that's a great example of the coding and how it would work. It's really not super high level sometimes, you know, but it worked. Yes, that did. Porter Halliburton, who's class of 1963 and also a uh, lieutenant commander in the Navy, who was a POW himself, 
and um, also he and his wife, Marty, are mentioned in your book, he asked a question ahead of time. He said, what is the most important thing that you want readers to take away from your book? Oh, gosh. I mean, there there's so many important things in, in this book, I think. I mean, it's hard to pick just one, but you know, if I were going to pick one and this, I might pick something different another night, but you know, one thing, maybe because I'm thinking about Ukraine a lot as all of us are right now. One thing that is really resonating with me right now is the power of the group. You know, if you are individuals and you're all, you know, complaining about stuff or doing your own thing, um, no one is going to hear you. And these wives are so smart. They realize this right away that the power of the group is what is going to work. So when they organize, and Bob Burroughs is the one, the Naval Intelligence Officer, he keeps saying to Sybil, organize, organize. And she's like, oh my God, I have so much to do. I've got all these kids and I've got this, I can't do it. And he's like, organize, you got to do it. The best advice she probably ever got in regards to this. So when the group gets stationary, when it becomes a, a legitimate organization, as she says, I waved my magic wand and made it so, you know, it's perception more than anything. And they have like $10 in their bank account, but they are a real group with stationary and the government is afraid, you know? So the same thing in Ukraine, like this banding together that we're seeing there, this is what might save them. And this is what saves these women. And ultimately what saves these men from the Hanoi Hilton is the organization, the League of Wives that becomes the National League of Families, it has terms, has things that they insist on that we'll talk about at the at the end of the talk that must happen. And, and people pay attention and they sit up and listen because they are a legitimate group. So I would say, you know, for right now, that's kind of what I'm gravitating towards as, as the most important part of this story as it applies to um, topical events of the day. Of the day, yeah. And I can hear organize in my head. <laughs> and probably you did too as you were schlepping your kids around to different places. Organize, I've got yes, <laughs> Organize, it's always a good thing. I mean, it applies to so many topics, you know, big and small. But in this case, it's like a lifesaver. It's like a life and death thing. Without that organization, no one was listening. These women were like shouting into the wind. Nobody heard them. I mean, in order to have that voice, they had to have a group and they had to organize. So it's a great example of like grassroots um, organizations and, and leadership. Yeah, you know, I've spoken to a lot of leadership groups about this book, which was not, it was not my intent to write like a business book, but I've had a lot of business groups come to me um, to talk about the leadership and the grassroots kind of organization that the women had. Um, we have had a couple, some questions coming in through the chat, so I'm going to add some of those in and kind of go back and forth between, again, some of the pre-submitted questions and some of the folks who are on uh, right now. So um, Barbara Deffenbaugh Howard, class of 92, um, asks, I've only just started the book, but Heath mentions Dean Rusk, class of 31, in the first two chapters. A question for Heath, in your research, were you intrigued to learn more about Dean Rusk? Or did you find anything surprising or interesting as you researched? Oh, Barbara, hello. And I loved Barbara's post. Thank you. Barbara's going to come work for me after this, of course. She is a wonderful um, PR person. You know, Dean Rusk, I didn't really get into him so much. Now, I did. You would think I would have gone deeper on that just because of the whole Dean Rusk connection. He was not the one that particularly intrigued me, despite the connection um, McNamara was the one that I really like, you know, you kind of have to pick a couple of people and really drill down and, and McNamara, who was kind of one of the villains of the book, quite honestly, I quickly got off Dean Rusk and kind of went off, um, with McNamara because, you know, the Pentagon papers and, you know, he, he knows that this war is not working. He knows that this is a huge waste of, of, you know, blood treasure and everything else. 
but yet we keep going with it. And um, many of the POWs told me the one person they could not forgive was McNamara. So I think Dean Rusk was spared any wrath from me because I got so mad at McNamara and LBJ and Avril Harriman that I, I was like, oh, Dean Rusk, name check. And then I just kind of moved on. So I'm, I'm sorry, Barbara, I don't have a better answer. Um, I do mention him, he does come up briefly, but um, he was not one of the bad guys, you know, and he wasn't super prominent. So I, I moved on to other juicier subjects. <laughs> maybe maybe you'll have a future biography on him. It's possible. I'm always looking, always looking, though it'll probably be someone female. So sorry, Dean Rusk, but he might be a supporting player, possibly. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> in, in the book, you mentioned another book called The Navy Wife. Uh, that all the Navy wives were required to read. Did you have a chance to read it? And do you have any uh, favorites of the rules that they listed? Oh my God, did I read it? I mean, I was like crying. I was either like crying, laughing or really mad. Like it, it was just, and I was like, okay, this is the sixties. You know, we can't put our now onto then. So uh, yes, but it was, maddening. I mean, it was a lot about jello molds and like, you know, presentation of fabrics and, you know, all these things, all of which are fine, but, you know, it, it, it was a lot of the wife's role. Like this is the role of, of the Navy wife. And if you want to be a good wife and do you want your husband, if you want them to be successful, you must look this way. You must dress this way. You must stay in your place and you must keep quiet. That was the biggest message I got is, you know, wives and children need to stay out of the way and, and be quiet. I mean, it was very 19th century, really, when you think about it. I mean, it was kind of ridiculous. But, you know, the 60s and the early 70s are really just a blip on the screen. It's not long ago at all in the course of history. So it was kind of horrifying to me how circumscribed these women were with these roles. But that book was a godsend. I mean, that just gave me so much meat to, to get into, to sort of sink my claws into, to start from. Because the women start there, but that's not where they end up. You know, they, they end up tossing the protocol guides out the window because there is nothing in these books, which is kind of crazy, nothing in these books written by former military wives about what to do when your husband is shot down and is a POW or an MIA. There's just no recommendation. You're like, we've had other wars. Why is this not even in here? So, you know, it was that, it was, it was really, and it was also kind of a propaganda manual to, to brainwash these women into being a certain way. So that made it even so much more compelling when they throw this off. And, and this is not to say they reject the whole book or all parts, there's so many great things about the military too. I didn't want it to be a wholesale rejection of that. I mean, they had this military family of women, many of whom they were closer to when this was over than their own blood family, because they understood these other POW MIA wives, what it was like. So the military created, and I try to really balance that in the book, created many great things for these women, but the protocol manuals were really, I mean, they're just propaganda, basically. If you read them, you will either laugh or be horrified or, or both. Um, the ones from the mid-60s specifically were the ones that I used for the book. Thank you. Um, and we're going to do a quick, uh, just a lightning round, and then we'll close. Um, another classmate of your, yours, Blaine John, asked, um, what is the most interesting item you have come across as a curator? Oh, yes. Hello, Blaine. I was so excited to see Blaine was going to be here. Okay, so item, which actually connects to Porter and Marty Halliburton. So um, we, I have an exhibit uh, which has a little bit different name. It's like the League of Wives, Allies, and Advocates. This is the one I did for the late Senator Dole, who I was so crazy about. And he he's also a big presence in this book. He was one of the big supporters of these women. So did this exhibit for Senator Dole um, that's been traveling the country now for about five years, the best or the most interesting artifact I came across, let me say, aside from the Navy wife, which was really one of my top ones, but besides that, uh, Marty and Porter in their, I believe in their attic, had had for years a 
kind of a chandelier object made out of POW bracelets. So when Porter returned home, you all, I don't know if anyone knows about the POW bracelets. I talk about this a lot in the book, but these were used as a fundraiser to raise money for the POW MIA cause. And they would there, you would have a, a bracelet, a metal bracelet with the date of the shoot down of the POW or MIA, their name, their rank, uh, just a few things on there. And it was a symbol. Um, you know, now we have bracelets for all kinds of causes, but it really came from those bracelets originally. So when Porter returned home, if you had bought a bracelet, they kind of randomly had different POWs names on them. So if you had Porter's bracelet, you were supposed to mail it back to him, which many people did. So they had collected, um, Porter and Marty had collected these bracelets and arranged them um, into a sort of um, mobile or chandelier that hung over their breakfast table for many years. And I saw a picture of this in a book uh, that por uh, about Porter, about his experience. And I was like, I have got to have that for the exhibit. So they very kindly like got it out, kind of re told me how to reassemble it. And I, because again, I'm horrible at anything mechanical. Um, I am a content creator. I'm not good at mechanical things. So we had some, my curatorial assistant that uh, kind of put that back together and we hung it over um, a breakfast table with a lot of different artifacts. And it it was and is the star of this show. People comment on that object more than anything else we have in the show um, in any city because you add people, add artifacts, but it's always the star. So I would say that's my favorite. That's wonderful. I'd love to see that. I can't wait to see the show. Um, this is uh, for the chat, but um, and then I'll come to a final question. Um, this is more for the wives that are on the call. Um, Barbara again asked, she said her neighbor and her husband just finished training to become a commanding officer team. What words of advice would you offer to them? So if you are on the call, the wives who are on the call, if they would like to write in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, while I ask you, Heath, a um, uh, last question, which is really, um, you are, um, you're, how do you determine what famous woman, women in history you're gonna write about next? Can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming book and maybe about the possibility of the movie um, that I'm assuming Reese Witherspoon would try to play Sybil in? I don't know, but that was what I put together. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on next and any, any updates on movie? Sure, sure. Yes. Well, so the next, you know, the next book I'm working on is I even brought my Time magazine with Pat Nixon. I'm kind of, you know, I get real obsessed with whoever I'm writing about, much to my family's chagrin. So Pat Nixon, who is um, Richard Nixon, the, you know, the disgraced president, you probably remember or have heard of Watergate. So Pat was first lady and um, she's very mysterious. We don't know a lot about her and she was a very private person. She's almost like a sphinx um, to us. Some people call her the Greta Garbo of American politics, which I think is really interesting. So I'm working on a book about her. We have a TV series kind of in development um, about Pat. If it works, it'll be kind of a limited series. Um, and then the movie, you know, with League of Wives and, and all of that, uh, the movie is is moving. It COVID, unfortunately, right when it was optioned, COVID happened. And so it just, everything shut down in Hollywood, unfortunately. But we have recently, they have picked back up. We, we had one script that nobody liked. So we are now out to a bunch of new writer directors. Um, if anyone knows anyone they think would be a great candidate, let me know. But we've got about seven people we've kind of narrowed it down to. So I'm hoping things are going to really start to move. Um, once, usually once you get a director, from what I understand, it tends to fall into place because then you get the actors and, you know, the script gets written and all of that. So um, that's kind of where things are with that. And in terms of like who I pick and why I pick them, I mean, it's probably always going to be women. I feel like there are so many stories we have just gotten to the tip of the iceberg at this point. And I just, I, at least for now, I want to keep mining that vein. And that's kind of the area I've always worked in. So, you know, it's going to be a woman. I really like 
politics, which is something I kind of came to a little later. I, you know, I never, I was very apolitical for a very long time and really League of Wives, I got so mad about it. I was like, how have I been so out of it? I haven't been paying enough attention. So now I'm like a junkie, you know, I'm just watching it like 24 seven all the time, every channel. It's, it's, it's a bad addiction. Um, it could be worse, but you know, that we all have our vices. So um, I'd like to do something about women in politics and maybe people we just don't know about. I have a couple of people I'm looking at, um, maybe a group biography of women in government that we don't know about. But, you know, it just somebody has to hit me and it has to be right it, because you're pretty much like married to this person until the book is done. So I, it's got to be someone I'm kind of admire in, in some way. Um, and it needs to be someone we don't know much about and someone who's a challenge to know. If, if they're too easy, I don't want them. You know, that's boring. Needs to be a challenge. So um, so I hope I've answered all of those questions. You did wonderfully. Thank you so much. And um, one final is, it's Women's History Month. How would you, in one minute, um, say the, the historical impact of the, the women in the, the the women that you write about, the League of Wives, what's their historical impact? Yes, well, you know, their impact is these are conservative military wives who step out of that box, which is really brave, and they become activists, diplomats, spies. You know, that's a huge thing. They um, also insist, they force the American government to take notice, to listen to them, they also, in that Paris Peace Treaty at the end of the war, guess what? In all wars, it, we don't always promise we're going to get the prisoners back. These women made sure that these guys like Porter would come back, that they would be repatriated, and that the missing would be accounted for as best possible. Um, they also stop the torture. They are one of the big factors in stopping the torture with going to the media telling the media that the Geneva Conventions of War are not being observed. No less than John McCain told me that. He said it was like a light switch going off. The torture stops. The guys get better food, better medical care. They were, he was taken out of solitary confinement. I mean, that is huge. They saved lives with what they did. And I think, you know, the final thing is, you know, I work with a lot of young military spouses, people who are just going into it, people who are have been in it, but they need some inspiration. These women are a huge legacy for military spouses and spouses today, male or female. These are role models. These are people we need to know about. They need to be in all the history books. And I am going to continue to, to work on trying to get them in the curriculum different places. But I mean, they're groundbreaking. So it was an honor and a privilege to, to be the one that, that got to help tell that story. Thank you so much, Heath. It's an honor and a privilege for me to have a chance to talk with you tonight. And for those of us who are listening, if you want to share this with others, this will be available on our YouTube channel within the next week. Please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from our office, which will include the link to the channel. Um, if you've not yet joined our virtual book club, please do so. Our March selection is Clint Smith, Class of 2010, How the Word Was Passed, fantastic book as well. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening. Thanks again to Heath Hartage Lee. And as always, it is a great day to be a Wildcat. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Heath. Thank you. It was wonderful. Go class of 92. Woo. <laughs> Good night. Good night.